Yeah. So we've been, I guess, just moving it right along. We went from, I mean, just looking back at our day, we went from, you know, figuring out what the right media players are, um, you know, asking the right questions for, to, to really find the right CMS softwares. How, and then like, we've gotten into kind of more of the ROI, obviously, talking about the money, the, <laughs> the yes. ROO. Um, and now we're looking at scalability and the longevity of the digital signage system with this other session, this next session, which is called Future Proofing a Digital Signage System. Okay. And um, I think one of the coolest things, I, I, I love the, like, I love the hyphenated two words. Mm -hmm. They're two words, but they're hyphenated. Um, but future proofing, um, because it, well, I guess once a digital signage network is installed, it rarely even gets smaller. Um, usually yeah. within a year, the organization who deploys it wants it to grow because they We're see the, the efficacy of it. They're like, let's go, let's <laughs> yeah, keep let's going. Keep going. Um, so, you know, finding the right type of, of the right hardware, um, the right software that will scale and involve uh, and evolve with the demand um, is extremely important. And so this session will address how to do this as well as the maintenance um, of the contracts, um, network changes, capacity, and evaluating finance, uh, financing options with the client. So this is gonna be really cool. Um, and just a, a, a nice little note, if you guys remember Sandy Stanbaugh of Cinex, she's yep. coming back to moderate the panel. Um, so I'm super excited oh, wow, to uh, bring, oh. hey there. How are you? Well, I'm going to go ahead. Good, good. It's so good to see you back. And I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce the rest of the panel because we have a pretty star-studded panel today. Um, and if there's any time at the end, I will come back uh, at the end to ask some live audience questions. Sound good? That sounds good. Thanks, guys. Awesome. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today um, for day two of design. So um, it's been a it's been a busy day, lots lots to learn. But um, but anyway, so our session here is on um, future proofing our digital signage network. Um, I'm Sandy Sandball, Vice President of um, SNX Corporation, and I've been with the company about 18 years. I'm responsible for our visual solutions business, our collaboration practice, and some specialized mobility. Um, I'm so excited to be joined today by two industry experts um, from our partner, Diversified. Um, Mitch and TJ bring years of experience in all facets of developing and managing digital signage networks, um, and we're so lucky to hear their insights today. Um, so welcome, uh, TJ and Mitch. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm actually going to give you guys a second to introduce yourselves um, and maybe get a little bit about your background and kind of what you do um, there at Diversified as it pertains to, to the topic today. So um, I'll start with you, Mitt. Sure. Uh, my name is Mitch Mittler. I'm the Vice President for uh, and Sales for t Design and Technology uh, with our Digital Media Group. Um, so the, that's the group TJ and I are both with. Um, our specialty is specifically working in digital signage, large format, experiential um, projects, uh, is what our group within Diversified specializes in. So I work with some cost direct customers, a lot of our sales uh, account executives on the sales team, on helping them identify uh, you know, techno uh, what technology will meet their customers' needs for um, signage and large format display. Perfect. Great. Hey, okay, TJ, you're up. I'm TJ DeQuala, Director of Creative Services within Media Group. i um, been with Diversified for just about 13 years, worked closely with Mitch. Uh, my responsibilities are really looking holistically at client needs and determining what content management systems they should be putting in. Um, so content management and operating those networks falls within uh, my team's responsibility. But also, as the title says, Creative Services, making content, whether it's passive, interactive, or dynamic, and helping our clients achieve their long-term visions within their network. That's great. Well, good. Well, thank you guys for being here today. Um, we're gonna, we got a lot of stuff to talk about, so I think this time's gonna go pretty fast. Um, but I wanted to, I guess I'll just start us off with um, kind of talking about the setup. As you guys are, are you know, talking to a, a, a new, um, you know, customer or even with an existing network, um, Mitch, you know, when you're talking to them, how do you, um, where do you start when you're thinking about you know, building out that network and ensuring long, longevity and, and scalability from a technology perspective. Sure. So the, the first thing to typically try and find out from them is what are their goals? You know, what is the goal of this network? Is it a advertising based network and looking for a financial return on investment? Is it corporate communications where they're really just looking to communicate, you know, 
message out to their customers. So it's more of a perceived ROI. Um, is this a brand network that's only going to show their brand content? Um, so it's, you know, needs to meet the brand goals and you know, f- focus on those brand goals. So like to identify what that is up front. And then a lot of it's collaborative working with uh, the construction teams and the marketing teams or advertising teams and bringing TJ and his team in to say, okay, how do we get you to that vision? What, you know, what are you looking to do? You know, where do you, where, where does it make the most sense to put some sort of visual element? What is that visual element? Try and you know, really work collaboratively with them and, and be a, a true partner with them to determine how can we help them see that journey from when somebody enters, you know, enters that whatever the space is, whether it's a retail space, a transit hub, an airport, or whatever it is, how do we get those messages across effectively um, and ef- efficiently to whoever the end customer is? And the end customer is always different. Um, you know, yeah, it could be, it could be consumers, it could be employees. Um, it, it really, so we would like to start there. Um, and then from there, we can work with them to determine what the right technology for the space is. You know, are they someone who's looking at, yeah, we do, you know, if it's a retail store, they may be doing three year refreshes. Well, we want to make sure we gauge it to the right product. That's going to give them what they need for that type of cycle versus it could be a, someone else who does more of a five year refresh and they need a longer a uh, longer term program, you know, on a large format spectacular, we could be looking at anywhere between seven and 10 years that we're trying to keep that technology piece going. And we want to make sure that we, we, we specify the right level of product to achieve the goal, but also maintain um, that they're not, it's surprise day two that, oh, there's recurring, there's something else that happens. And so it's really, a, really understanding the customer, their goals, their needs, and working with them to make sure they get a program that's going to fit those long-term goals. Yeah, and so as you're as you're having these conversations, are there um, certain technology considerations? Are there certain things that you um, that you really just you have to make sure are addressed on the front end versus kind of once the network's implemented and things start to progress? Oh, abs- absolutely. Um, so, you know, from a technology side, we want to make sure they, you know, they, they've got the network infrastructure, you know, the network support team, the support, you know, everything runs on a network. So we want to make sure that they, you know, that's that's in place, whether they're providing themselves or we need to build that as part of the project. Um, other technology things, um, power, you know, a lot of, you know, if they go to large format, you know, they do draw a amount of power, there is a cost to that. Um, so they need to have that in place. Um, so, you know, there's there a lot of factors we need to roll through with them. Yeah, the sure. and, you know, also life lifespan of the product. You know, it depends on you know. We can get products for you know. Are they uh you know a five day a week store? Are they a twenty four seven operation? So that's going to determine what product we're going to use and what, what level of product, and that's going to affect the the you know the, their capital costs as well as their operating. Yeah. So TJ, what about on your side? So on that on that kind of building out the creative plan and the, and the content for a new network, are, are there also considerations that need to be made around future proofing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I talk to my clients, I always like to tell them, we need to start with the end, right? Because the reason these networks are going in, the reason we're putting up LEDs and, and signs is to communicate with audiences, put content up there. And if you don't have a clear vision for what you're trying to do with the technology, it's hard, A, to future-proof it, and B, it's hard to maintain it as it goes because there's a lot of considerations that need to be taken for who's going to be making the content, how often, who's, who's in charge of really distributing it and running the network from an operational standpoint. Um, and if you don't have a lot of those governances and that plan over the next year at least in place, um, it's, it's difficult to show value in the network if you're not using it to its full potential. Now, when we start with the end in mind, you know, we're really talking about what do we want to do with that message and how is the software and the technology going to enable you to do what you want with that message. So if a client comes and says, yeah, right now we really just want to put, you know, some JPEGs on a screen and, and say, go this way. I try to probe them like, well, what about a year from now? What about as the network grows? leadership sees value, the messages are resonating, what else do you want to do with that? And that's when they start, well, we, maybe we can bring in some dynamic stuff, some interactive stuff. Okay, let's go through all your use cases, you know, live TV, live streaming, all these variables that I do from a consulting perspective will help me line up 
A, what software would be best for them? So what can the software support within their creative vision? How the software works within their current team's workflow? And then pair that software in the creative use cases with the hardware working with Mitch to determine the right ultimate whole package to put into place. So it's always with the end in mind and you build backwards. If you don't have a clear vision for where you see your, your network growing, it's near impossible to future proof it. So you have to, like the name suggests, look into the future. And, 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 uh, and the, con the, the content plan, that plan, that end goal to go from the visual that TJ has got in mind there has to work with the technology. They, they, they have to be planned together. Uh, it can't be just, oh, we're going to put a screen on the wall. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out later. You know, we're, we're not, you know, we just got to get the construction budget. In. Um, you know, it has to have yeah. that vision it has to be part of that process. Um, or you're putting a screen on a wall to put a screen on a wall. Um, and that's not going to give you any return on investment. Um, yeah, we've, you know, seen, it, we've seen hardware get put in and that hardware fit the plan for, for what it was doing and where they wanted to start. But as soon as they started adding more complexities, you know, sometimes that hardware is just not capable of, of rendering what they want it to do. So now even before that three year free fresh that Mitch was talking about, now you're limiting what you can do with the system when you're not considering putting a little bit more investment up front in the hardware to grow with your vision over the years. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure um, a lot of those uh, limitations on the front end really are about budgets, right? Um, so mm -hmm. coming up with that, you know, capital expenditure, operational, right? So that's something that I, I definitely want, kind of wanted to go to next, um, Mitch, is just, you know, how does the use of um, both operational and then also capital budgets impact um, the ability to maximize the relevance and then also the scalability of the network? Um, what are you guys seeing there? Yeah, so uh, one of the biggest things I think we've seen there with budgets is the operations team is not involved with the construction side of things. So construction's concerned, you know, they've got a budget, I've got to build X. And if you don't have that operating team, whether it's the creative services team, the content team, or just the folks who are, you know, responsible for keeping things up and running, you know, um, and, and, and taking care of the service contracts. If they're not talking early on in the project, um, things can go haywire really quickly because you'll wind up saying, oh, construction's done, here you go, here's the keys to the store. And then you have another group going, okay, what did I, what did I inherit? Um, you know, how am I going to deal with this? So really having them involved so they can do their fiscal planning as well as making sure you're meeting whatever, you know, whatever it's determined up front. Um, and that content piece of it's a big piece of it as well, because there is a recurring cost to content. Um, and, and different programs have different ways of funding that. Sometimes it's, you know, retail. Sometimes it's by, it's by campaign. Uh, sometimes it could be by, by product group, depending on what kind of retail space it is. It could be by product. Um, if you're not at a home, it's by advertiser. Um, but it's really understanding what those ongoing costs, you know, not just your, 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 your one-time costs up front um, that are going to affect the build budget, but what are those ongoing costs for, you know, content, service, you know, services when people do forget about. Sometimes that does get captured up front for a few years, but when that service agreement ends and somebody says, oh, yeah, no, that was three years ago, you know, it's year four, that tends to get forgotten. Um, and it needs to be, you know, it needs to be, you know, made sure that team knows going through. And another piece is, you know, staffs change, people change. Um, that, you know, that is being communicated through the process of that, hey, you know, you're running out, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're coming up on a renewal or, you know, making sure that people understand it's coming and not saying, hey, it's due tomorrow and they don't know it. Um, so, you know, like most things, it's communication. It's making sure there's a plan and everybody's executing that plan on, you know, uh, and their piece of the plan. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's a lot of collaboration, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's a lot more than sticking a screen up on the wall. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's um, a lot more than a power outlet. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so TJ, and then uh, as you're looking at you know budgets and and how that um you know it, uh, Mitch talked about it a little bit, but you know um, what best practice are you seeing or, um, you know with leveraging those budgets to provide managed services and then long-term um, content planning and then also refresh right so just like Mitch said it, it varies based on the client but more importantly the application of the industry that we're in right so you're looking at an enterprise network doing corporate communication you know there's, there's probably a good plan for the content refresh that'd be happening almost weekly 
um, advertising, of course. I think we lost TJ there for a moment. I think he's frozen. You probably know what he was saying, don't you, Mitch? <laughs> you want to jump in? Sure. So no, it's making sure, you know, that, that it, you know it, it's about the content plan. Make sure whether that content's being refreshed weekly, monthly. Um, you know, that there's, there's a plan behind that content. Um, and and it's, it's timely. And it, there, there's a bunch of techniques for that. You, know, you can use, there's some really great subscription services out there. Um, that can be used. Um, and some of it is marketing, you know, making sure the marketing teams, a lot of the marketing teams will have a piece of their budget um, available to um, um, will have a marketing budget available to them, um, mm -hmm. where they know that they need to budget in for every time there's a new campaign, new product launch, that there's a piece of the budget that, you know, is carved out for that content. Um, HR on, on the enterprise side, having HR, having you know, getting HR into having a cadence um, for content um, is, is really important. That they, um, you know, that they're, they're refreshing. You know, no, you know, seeing the same message over and over, it becomes it becomes uh, a background. Nobody nobody looks at it. So it needs to it needs to have some element of change to it. You know, even if you have standard formatting, sometimes you need to change it a little bit so it catches people people's eyes. Even you know when you come up with your branding, your theming. Um, but you know, yeah. but that so also you, requires a budget and resources. Yeah. So, so would you say that the best practice from a budgetary perspective is uh, is blended? Is it a blended capex, opex approach, or I mean, what what's your opinion on that? Um, it, it is a bit of a blended, uh, because, but it's, it's a lot. Most of the time, we see the content is considered an operational expense, um, okay. you know, um, versus a capital expense, um, where it's coming out of some, you know. And, but it, it, it's somebody having, you know, it, and a lot of it has to do with resources. It's always finding who's the guy. There's always somebody who has to actually take ownership of it. Um, and that piece sometimes can get lost. And that, that's sometimes, you know, that's when things will get outsourced occasionally. Um, and, and come, you know, they'll outsource to us to, to, to support that content because they may not have that resource or that resource goes on vacation or it gets put on a temporary assignment and needs somebody to fill the role. So it's making sure they have those, those bits and pieces. Well, great. Here's TJ back just in just in time for uh, yeah. Did, you, did you hear my complete great answer that I gave, or did you miss it? <laughs> you know what's so great is you guys work so closely together. Mitch just jumped right in for you, so it worked out. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so I do I do have a, a follow up question though, Mitch around um, or sorry TJ around um, around content trends and kind of just market trends as a whole. Um, but w what are you seeing um, around content trends that you know it's kind of new that maybe should be considered and part of planning a new or a refreshed digital science network um are there you know any considerations regarding like COVID 19 or return to public spaces or anything like that that you're seeing that that might be interesting yeah we're seeing a lot of um i wouldn't say new but um we're seeing a lot of trends now post covid to try to make things touchless because that was always a big concern, especially in the front with touch screens and how do we make sure that the touch screens our clients have um, can also be operated without touch. So looking at um, some cool technology that you can leverage your cell phone to be a mouse cursor on the screen and establish a one-to-one -one connection with that touch screen and be able to control it from your phone, which is super cool. There's a few companies out there doing a really great job at doing that. Voice activated, we've always heard of you know, being talked about in the industry for a while, like Siri, Google Assistant Alexa type voice activation and voice control for interactive screens. Gesture, again, technology that's been around, but finding a, a more a, you know, more applicable reason to be used in these situations as opposed to, wow, that would be cool. Now it's, wow, we kind of need this. So let's you know hunker down and really make it work. Um, so those trends are definitely at the forefront across the board in this, um, in this post-COVID environment, as we're trying to bring people back to um, back to work and back to public spaces, and I think it's really cool because that technology was was always really exciting to me. Um, but you had hesitation. A was it was slightly new technology. People maybe didn't want to put it in. Um, but now you know we're we're past that. The technology's gotten a lot better in the past year too, and people are motivated to put that stuff in there. Um, so I think that's really great. Um, 
in a, in a COVID trend. But content trends in general, um, making content more purposeful, uh, making it more attractive and more, in my opinion, a little bit more abstract instead of hitting somebody on the hammer with your message, you know, kind of disguising it a little bit. Um, and again, going back to where the screens are and what we're doing, you know, I'm spending a lot of time focusing on large lobbies again and making experiences uh, for audiences is really going back to the generative content, you know, dynamic content that is more uh, artful and, and more creating an atmosphere and, and displaying company data in a unique and exciting way that can't be duplicated from one business to another business because it's their personal data and creating um, some really beautiful lobby experiences out of that through data visualization. So generative and interactive content, I think we're going to see, and I hope to see a lot more of, because I like working on those projects as well. Yeah, sounds like fun. Creating those um, really cool immersive experiences, right? So whether it's in corporate or retail or other. Yeah, we talked a little bit about that the other day, didn't we? Um, so Mitch, on, on the, you know, keeping on that same path of trends that we're seeing, you know, there's so much, um, you know, being talked about around things like AI and analytics and, you know, certainly as TJ touched on touchless environments. Um, things like 5G and, you know, and then certainly throwing in, you know, a little bit of network security as well. Um, so can you talk specifically about what you're seeing and, you know, what you're, as you're building out new networks or even coming into existing um, and doing some refresh, what are you thinking about as far as, the, you know, technology and the trends there? Sure. So a lot, you know, you know, some, some of it is COVID driven. Um, so we're seeing some, you know, more interest in, um, the the the, the interact you know the gesture gesture based interactive um, you know touchless interactive so whether that's you know truly motion tracking or having people connect uh, use their use their using their phones to um, to be the user interface so they're using their own device versus touching a touch screen though I, I think that's going to come back you know that'll come back quickly we'll all be back in those spaces in, in time. So I think that's going to come back and we're not seeing people not, you know, as TJ mentioned, you know, lobbies are, you know, we're doing a lot, a lot, you know, lobby refreshes, people, a lot of uh, real estate taking advantage of spaces being empty, saying, hey, what can we, we've got this, you know, got the access for a few more months. What can we do while, you know, while we can do that? So what can we do to entice people to our spaces? You know, and it's, you know, yes, it, it, it's high pitch, you know, pixel pitch on LED. It was, hey, do a four millimeter, do a two and a half millimeter. Now we're, about, you know, you know, pretty standardly doing this stuff in you know, the the one to two millimeter pitch. Um, it's integrating you know lighting to it. Um, you know, it's really now all the it's not just displays anymore. It's lighting. It's sound. It's really that inverse of a environment. You know, we can tie with LED lighting fixtures. We can tie a lighting fixture into this video system just as easily as you know we, and as, as putting another screen on the wall. So now the whole environment can be rethemed. Um, laser phosphor projectors has given us the ability to start doing more with project, you know, projection, whether that's full on projection mapping or, you know, just doing specific pieces of it, just using it as another tool in the toolbox. So, you know, I, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of remote workforce. So how does digital signage adapt to that? Um, we're, we're working with customers now that are bringing that to the desktop and using, you know, the, the, some of the CMS systems have a component that allows us to bring that messaging to the desktop for the, you know, for the remote workforce where it, it had been a thing to do before. Uh, there, there's a little more push on it now because, we, you know, there's going to be a trend for, for a, a while um, that, you know, people are going to be, you know, whether they're fully remote or really, you know, not in the office five days a week, maybe three days or two days a week, but you still need to communicate with your employees. So using the tech, you know, using a consistent technology platform to, but using different visual media to get those messages out. Um, so, um, so we're seeing, we're seeing more and more of that. All right. Um, I'm in. It looks like I'm in. We've got Jeffrey. We took over TJ. <laughs> You never know when you're going to run into the virtual Live, live TV. <laughs> we knew we were the place to be, didn't we? <laughs> so um, that's so great. You guys, thanks so much for that information. And I, I, I want to kind of end real quick. We've got about, about three minutes left. I want to um, just give you guys an opportunity to talk about two things. Number one is the biggest mistake that you're seeing um, when folks are either not future-proofing or trying to future-proof a network. Um, and then number two would be, what recommendation do you have? 
Um, and, and you know, we'll we'll split this all. all. PJ, I'll let you go first. So we'll we'll start with you. And give give uh, Mitch a second to breathe. But um, on the on the technology side, so biggest mistake and um, you know recommendation. Um, I think we touched on it before. The biggest mistake, in my opinion, that I'm seeing is um, taking the inexpensive route, finding the more always going with the most budget friendly hardware and the budget friendly software, um, not fully recognizing where you want the system to go and just planning for the least common denominator. I mean, you can always swap out bits of the hardware in the network when needed, if you need a more powerful PC for one thing, but don't make all your decisions on what's, what's the simplest and, and cheapest to get really, I mean, me, I, I want every bell and whistle on everything that I ever get. Um, you may not have to go to that extreme, but find somewhere in the middle. Don't don't sell yourself short. Okay, great. All right, Mitch, you're up. Um, biggest thing I think is for, it, it it is more people not understanding. You know, being being prepared for the the continuing operation, um, seeing it as a short term, not not looking long term at, at what they're looking to do. Um, not being prepared for those support for support maintenance, not being prepared for content, um, thinking, oh, what, we're just going to do this, and when we're done, it's done. Um, so I think that, you know, not, just not looking further than, uh, you know, looking at far enough of that horizon. Um, they really need to go a, little, a bit further out um, and be prepared for that. Yeah, yeah looking at, like, the immediate need or the immediate problem you're trying to solve versus what might be coming. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes and, sense. and that plan's going to change over time. Even if they have a plan, it's going to be modified, but not, not having a long enough, long range plan. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good feedback. So we heard a lot about collaboration, um, definitely looking at not just, you know, throwing hardware out there, but making sure that we were really thinking about um, the, the content piece and, and what we're trying to communicate and how we're trying to utilize the network, right? Um, and then also thinking about things like the analytics and the, you know, the customer experience um, to the, te the fun stuff TJ gets to do, right? <laughs> the customer experience and creating those immersive, um, those immersive areas. There's so much fun stuff coming in, in, in the digital signage um, space. And, you know, we, and I, we've talked about this before. We talked about it last week when we were, we were preparing for this about how, um, you know, how exciting it is right now to be in the space and how much growth we expect to see, um, you know, coming out of, out of where we've been, right? So um, I just so appreciate you guys being here today and giving some of your insights. You guys are, are you know, living it every day and, um, you know, the experts and been doing this a long time. So I really appreciate you guys coming forward and, and talking with us today, for sure. Great. Well, thanks, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much, Sandy. We appreciate everybody for sharing. And actually, before you guys leave, I had a couple of questions, um, if you guys don't mind. Uh, actually, one specific audi audience question. And if we have time for another, I'll throw out another one as well. Um, I have one with Norman. Norman Plant asks, I work for a private university in Michigan, and we want to utilize digital signage for the first time. We don't know what we don't know. Great point. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, what tools or info are available to help us initiate this process? Um, sure. I mean, so obviously the um, the DFS website, there's, there's a lot of Avixa has got a lot of information up on their site where you can reach out. Uh, Rave is a good resource as well. Um, you can reach out to us. We'd be you know, happy to talk to you. Um, but uh, you know, if, if there, there's a lot of, I'm not prepared with any specific ones, but there are a lot of good resources out there. Um, I would say that really talk to your team, start thinking about your campus, start thinking about your buildings, where you want to message people, what do you want to message them? Start thinking about it. Think of it from the point of the person looking at the screen. If I'm standing in, in building A at the front door, what information do I need? What do you want to communicate to them? If they're going into a dorm, what do you need to yeah. communicate with them there? Really think about what your content needs to be, your format, your layout, what the right screen, that'll all come. But start thinking about really who's your audience, what do you need to communicate to them, and where are you going to communicate to them? Yeah, and, and look at what other people in similar environments are doing. Um, notice what you like or, or don't like about them. And as Mitch said, you know, start consulting internally. Come up with a strategy and approach and objectives. 
Um, there's a lot of resources online. You can look up digital signage software. So you, like Mitch said, you can um, get a consultant to help pair the right software to your requirements. And you can even hire consultants to help write those requirements for you. But if you're looking at the market space and you're seeing what other people are doing and where you want to improve um, and what you may not need, document all that. Do your research for software features and, and determine which one works best for you. Perfect. All right. Anybody else want to add anything or we, we can move along from that? I know that's a pretty general question. So it's like, well, there's so many resources, but um, it sounds like starting with why and maybe getting a little bit of insight and seeing what other people are doing and what you enjoy um, is where you can start and then really try, trying to look for the right partners for you um, and the right resources so that you can connect and, um, and uh, get on with your project is what it sounds like. So I have another question, actually. Um, we've got just a little bit uh, under two minutes, and I'm, I'm really into generative content. I've actually got a, an opportunity to write about some generative content, and I get excited about it. I mean, Sandy, I know you said that you get excited about it, too. Um, it's just so cool, and I, I, I don't know if maybe there are some first-timers that have not been exposed to generative content. If, if anybody could give a little bit, maybe an example or like a case study of one of the vertical markets. Um, I know that Avixa has served. We've done a lot of uh, work within the retail you know, segment and, and covering some of that. But if anybody wants to speak to generative content, maybe what that is and maybe some of the key stakeholders and players that might need to come into to place to make sure that you have something like that um, type of content that will give you that, that kind of longevity. Um, I would love to hear from you guys. Sure. So, so generative content is content that's essentially being generated on the fly from external sources. Those external sources could be data points, you know, data feeds coming in um, with a sliding scale of, of how it affects the image on the screen or, you know, the art that's happening on the screen. It could be sensors. It could be any magnitude of inputs. And those inputs are consistently changing the content on a daily basis. So if you're building generative content, and there's a chance when you look at it, you'll never really see the same experience. So it's a good way to invest in beautiful content, but add longevity to that beautiful content because it is always changing and being you know, generated on the fly. Um, I see that a lot in, in the lobby spaces because you're building yeah. you know, those experiences and building that atmosphere um, and you can get really abstract or, and really purposeful. Um, and it's just, it, it's just something that has has legs as opposed to um, video production. Uh, and there's a lot of great mm -hmm. software partners that we have and a lot of great tools out there um, that make creating generative experiences relatively uh, easily. And there's a lot of great agencies that do wonderful work, you know, programming in you know, Unreal Engine or Unity or Cinder. Um, but it, it's all about not having to manage that content on a day-to-day -day basis and giving Right. Repeat audiences and new audiences is something new and exciting to look at when they come in. Right. So it's not like something is just on loop <laughs> over and over again. Correct. It's something that's evolving Correct. and changing. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate all the feedback. And um, we're going to kick it to our next session. That was, that was just, that was phenomenal. So <laughs> thank you guys.